G'day everyone, it's that time of the year again. We're doing our pre-season predictions. I say pre-season, but the AFL season is basically here, right? For the first time that I can remember, there is no gap between pre-season games, which have already started, and round one or opening round, uh, whatever whatever it's called, it's round zero, I don't know. So today is another edition of the True Footy Podcast, the first podcast episode since the season has started. Like I said, in my head, it's already started. And the premise of this video is to give you a bit more of a long form content version of my ladder prediction and talk a little bit more in depth about each individual team so you can get a feel of my rationale, I suppose. But in some cases, we are talking about a ladder prediction which was intentionally designed to shake things up and not necessarily logical. So I do think today's episode will give you a little bit of a different look at the ladder prediction that I have uploaded on the YouTube channel. And it also gives an opportunity for those who only listen to the podcast to get a feel for my predictions for season 2024. Now, ladder predictions suck. I like, I like It used to be my favorite video of the year. Now, it's probably my least favorite. But I will say, to be honest, some of the feedback from the video is probably the least vitriolic and most understanding I've received ever on a ladder prediction. So I do say thank you. Um, I mean, by all means, just let me know what you really think. But I do think, even though obviously everyone's going to disagree, and no two people ever have probably agreed perfectly on a ladder prediction, but... Generally speaking, the feedback is kind of like either they found parts of it funny or they just kind of understand that, you know, I'm trying to shake things up a little bit um, and, of course, disagreeing with me respectfully. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I felt fairly good about the feedback on it, to be honest. So thank you. Um, but today, we're going to talk through all these teams. Now, now, some of you would have probably followed the channel through the December and January period, and a lot of you wouldn't have. But for those who did stick around, I have a playlist on this channel called Analyzing Teams for 2024. So you can find literally a video of me analyzing teams' best 22s and their immediate depth and their prospects for 2024. I've done that over December and January and found I learned a lot. Like I got a really good feel for every team in the comp. And I also felt like as you go into them and you plot their best 22s and what it could ideally look like without injuries, etc., you realize that you you kind of rate each and every team a little bit more than you previously did because you, you just understand what the best possible outcome for them is. So that was a great experience and I do think that kind of served me well. But then you get to the ladder prediction and you have to order them and it becomes extremely tough. And not only that, you just have to make sure that you're not just simply ranking them based on what order you rate them because that is a very illogical way of trying to do a ladder prediction because the ladder changes so much every year and there's so many different variables you know mentality psychology of a football team is so important and injuries as well and those are two things we cannot possibly forecast so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through each of the 18 teams and i am going to just give a little bit of analysis and a, and a summary of what i think of that team and uh adds a little bit of depth to my ladder prediction so we're going to start from the bottom up as these typically start so north melbourne and west coast this this is an interesting debate and I'd imagine every North fan thinks they're going to finish higher than West Coast. And every West Coast fan thinks they're going to finish higher than North Melbourne. This is natural. And I'm not necessarily trying to talk anyone out of that perspective. But I do have my own thoughts. And it is tinged with a blue and gold filter, of course. But I do have West Coast 17th and North Melbourne 18th. Now, my justification for this is that from a logical point of view, I believe it's logical. North Melbourne just have a few chinks in their armor that make it hard for me to put them ahead of West Coast. Now, we're talking about the youngest team in the competition, the least experienced team, and they've also got a gaping hole positionally, and that's with their tall defenders. And, uh, you know, I've, I've harped on about their tall defenders. I think that that gap in their best 22 is obvious, and I think even with Griffin Logue, it isn't the strongest. It would be a lot stronger and probably would remove it from being a major concern, but if they're without Logue for half a season, they're relying on guys like Aiden Core. Is Charlie Common playing back? I'm not too sure, but past that, it's Toby Pink and, uh, you know, Callum Dawson. And I think between those three, none have played more than 10 games. So that, for me, is a genuine vulnerability. Now, it doesn't mean they can't overcome that. I really do like their runoff halfback with Sheasel and McKercher, like the idea of it anyway. And Fisher's come into this team. I know he did a hamstring. I'm not too sure how far off he is. But generally speaking, they've made tweaks and improvements there. I do, I do respect that. But... That is a, a clear positional weakness, and I think it's going to be tough for them to withstand dominant key forwards in opposition. So that's my first argument. I did a tier maker recently ranking midfields, and North Melbourne 
I put in bottom tier, which uh, I haven't replied to the comments yet. I will get to them as I'm recording this. But my justification for having them bottom tier was, I mean, first of all, a lot of people disagreed with that. I don't know if they're not fans or not. But yeah, I agree that the talent is there. Like LDU, like I love, like I've been talking him up so much. But, you know, who were the rest of their first choice midfielders? You have to remove Taron Thomas from this now. George Wardlaw's in there. He's played eight games. Like we're talking about, we're, we're talking about ranking them across the entire competition. I can't necessarily have George Woodlaw, you know, weighted heavily in this analysis because he looks like a young gun. But as a genuine inside mid, what are the chances he genuinely has like top tier impact next year? I think it's more likely going to be flashes of brilliance, a good year of improvement. But I don't think it'll stack up. Bailey Scott is a good wingman. Absolutely. Will Phillips is, has incrementally improved and I think is on the right track. And I think Dylan Stevens adds value, but it's still not a strong midfield. It is stronger than West Coast. And I, I am laboring here on North Melbourne. I, I won't be able to talk about every team this long, but we'll, we'll keep it moving. And with, with the forward line, obviously it's Larky, but it's Larky centric. And there's some really good medium forward types there. And, you know, with the biggest gap last year was 71 goals to Larky, 26 to Stevenson. I do think they have the tools to bridge that gap but at the moment it is likey century there's not a major concern i just think with the level of experience that they have i could see them starting the year well like the first two weeks of last year when we saw north melbourne beat west coast and beat Fremantle, i also think west coast weren't bad in that game so i genuinely think the standard of north melbourne's first two performances were high they were strong then i think they lost to hawthorne but what happened after that was a bad fall away and you could somewhat blame the Clarkson situation on that, but I, I think it's probably more to do with the young list that got a little bit jaded. So we're, we're talking about being able to withstand a whole season, and that's where West Coast... Again, it relies on West Coast having a normal injury list, but assuming they do, and I'm going to assume that they have at least a normal one, or even slightly worse than normal, the the maturity and the depth and, and experience is higher at West Coast. West Coast midfield is the porridge. Like, we can, we can move on to that. I just think there's... The midfield is a serious deficiency, but I do just think with the experience and probably, I, I think I've made this point before, I think North Melbourne's worst was nowhere near as bad as West Coast. That's absolutely unquestionable. But I do think the the rare bright sparks, the, the top tier performances we saw from West Coast were wins over GWS and wins over the Bulldogs. So the, the best probably eclipsed North as well. Anyway, I, I'm really laboring on these guys, but I, I do think the West Coast will slightly have North covered this year, barring some sort of injury crisis. And, you know, I made a video last year about West Coast finishing 13th. Well, no, that's where I predicted them. And I made a video saying West Coast would be better in 2024, in 2023, and then bad in 2024. But that video was largely pre entirely predicated on us having, you know, at least most of a season from Nick Nat Nui, Elliot Yo coming back into the side and performing, but we just, the injury crisis got worse. And I, I, I know you're sick about hearing it, so I'll leave it there. But just because you're sick about hearing it doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, so let's move to the rest of my bottom four. So I had Richmond and Hawthorne here. So since I've actually recorded this latter prediction, Hawthorne have had some uh, injury issues. There's no doubt about that. Now, that being said, I've, I've still tipped them in the bottom four, so I don't know how much it really shifts my opinion on where they're going to finish. Maybe they finished third last, I don't know. But at the moment, I have them improving by one position. And on the one hand, they've imported a gun forward line. There's no doubt about that. It has the potential, like it bats deep. There's potential there. And they're not so young that it's going to take them a while, with the exception of Nick Watson. But I feel like he could perform early. If the midfield, if the forward line is functioning, Nick Watson can contribute. You know, hypothetically, if he, if he walked into a shambles of a team, like he probably wouldn't have the same impact. The midfield's good. It's pretty, it's pretty good, like for its age and experience, like it's not absolute top tier, but it's it's good. And uh, hopefully Will Day, we see sooner rather than later. But the back line is the big vulnerability. Not so much medium types, and you know, Sicily's great. But um, you know, the, the blank injury, the ACL ruling him out for basically a year, that is going to be a problem because I think they went into 2024 light and they've replaced him with an SSP player, Ethan Phillips, that's his name. So that's a huge question mark. So that, that's where it sits for Hawthorne, um, is their backline vulnerability. But Sam Mitchell has got them playing a pretty good brand and it wasn't consistent and it did take them 10 rounds last year. But I just don't feel like Hawthorne are realistically a chance to dip down unless, unless their injuries really start to mount. 
and that I've said this previously, but I, I think I think it's usually a common thread between all wooden spoon teams. You'll probably find they had a bad injury run, generally speaking. Doesn't mean they're all good teams that should have finished higher, but generally a bad injury run is a big factor. And that leads me into Richmond, who I put third last. And my justification for this is, first of all, it's hard to really plot any other team. Like I feel fairly confident about the other three I've talked about. So you have to find, you have to pluck someone to drop. And that is obviously a little bit of conjecture. In fact, it's a lot of conjecture. But my reasoning for Richmond here is, yes, their best 22 isn't bad at all. But they, like their top end stars are still good. And even an aging Dustin Martin is still probably going to make them, you know, good. Well, especially when he has the ball. Uh, and, you know, guys like Bolton and Tom Lynch. But we don't know exactly when we're going to see Tom Lynch, I don't think. At least I haven't double checked that before recording this. But we know there's a bit of a foot injury in doubt for opening round, etc. But I think past that best 22, there is a, a serious lack of depth. And I do respect that Richmond fans have absolute faith. They, they do. For the most part, like that's what the comments suggest. And, you know, I'm, I back my Eagles in, so I'm not, uh, not criticizing anyone who, who's backing in Richmond this year. I think the midfield is good. It's probably a little bit inside dominant, lacks a bit of class. What, where I think what will ultimately or potentially get Richmond um, stuck this year is is injuries to those stars because I think they're very reliant on them and there's also going to be this need to get games into your, your banks Steely Green Caleb Smith uh, Trezise Ralph Smith like there's, there's more than that but you know I, I I think those guys could come in and play roles but I do think as far as depth goes that is their Achilles heel it's their underbelly their soft underbelly so as far as making a case for a team falling into the bottom four, I think it's easier with Richmond than others. But, you know, clear injury run and a successful first season for Adam Uze could see them pushing up closer to like eighth to tenth. But I don't see it higher than that. So let's move on. In the, in the video, I talked about a, the next batch of teams and I have three teams here where I'm a little bit confused on. So I had 12th Gold Coast, 13th Fremantle and 14th Essendon. This is kind of like the no man's land where... A lot of teams you're just not sure about tend to fall. Um, so for me, those are the three teams, Gold Coast, Fremantle, and Essendon. Let's start with Essendon. Again, a really hard team to get a read on. And I've probably copped some criticism for my takes on Essendon, generally speaking, for the last six months. But to be fair, like they've all generally been lighthearted. I, I still, still enjoy seeing that commentary. But for me, it probably comes down to a lack of faith. I don't, I don't believe in this Essendon team. With all due respect, and I will say that I actually do have, I have no issue with Essendon. I, and I, I would like to see him succeed. I'd even like to see North succeed. Maybe it's a byproduct of West Coast being irrelevant right now. But I don't have a real sense of rivalry or hatred of any team. When Druzy talks about Fremantle, I want them to lose to wipe this shit-eating grin off his face for a team that finished 14th. He is way too confident. But <laughs> generally speaking, I wish them well. But my take on Essendon is that I just see a lot of players that could go either way. And when you analyze their best 22, so we'll start with the positive. Like their, their forward line, I ranked it recently and I don't think it stacks up on paper, but I do think I could foresee it still being dangerous this year. And I do think maybe that lack of number one gun key forward, the number one uh, forward is probably Peter Wright and I do really rate him, but you know what I mean? Not a Coleman contender as such, but they do have like three talls in there in Langford, Wright, and to a lesser extent Stringer, who could go either way again. It's dangerous, it's dynamic. All three players could hurt you in different ways. There's height and Langford and Stringer are on the small side, but I, I actually kind of like the unpredictability of that. There's three evenly rated options there, somewhat. Again, I have a bit of faith in Stringer, but if it's not him, it might be Nate Caddy, and I think Nate Caddy is a jet. They've added a bit of creativity with that mix with Gresham. Menzi, pretty good pressure small forward. You know, kicked 23 goals or something last year. Um, I don't mind that mix. So I think there's potential there. And you look at the young midfielders and I still see potential. You know, guys like Caldwell, could he take his game to the next level? Like, he's a young guy. I think he's 2019 draft. Forgive me if I got the, the wrong, year wrong. But, um, you know, pretty young and shown good flashes. Can he mix it with the mids? Can Perkins do that? Sardis in his second year, how much can he contribute? There's a lot of players that could go either way. Uh, so I just, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant, but I'd, I wouldn't be shocked to see a big improvement. But this is where it leads back into the trust thing. 
and this the mentality of the Essendon side for a number of years hasn't been great. And if Essendon fans are bristling at that, I know, I know that Essendon fans themselves have been saying that. I funnily enough watched a video the other uh, today. I made a video in um, 2019, weird games of 2019, and I'd forgotten there was that random game where the Bulldogs, who were lower than Essendon, were winning 137 to 14 at that at one point. And, you know, these these lapses, these poor performances haven't really ever left us. Well, maybe that's dramatic to say, but what I will say is the last seven weeks was very concerning. Losing 20, uh, 21 goals to GWS. You can understand why there's a lack of faith. But I have put their ranges 8 to 14. So we'll see. I wish you well, Essendon, but forgive me, I just can't trust this season. I do kind of rate Brad Scott. I think, you know, I think what he did at North Melbourne with the talent he had was very respectable. Not outstanding, but respectable. And I think he could replicate that with Essendon. It might just take some time. Let's talk about Fremantle. Analyzing their best 22 is interesting. They're still a very young side, which kind of makes them a little bit unpredictable. And what has been a trend with this Fremantle group, even before Longmuir took over, is their ability to just randomly beat good teams and then completely capitulate at home to a rubbish side. It's absolutely a trend over a number of years. And... Is that a good sign? Maybe it is. If a young side is, is showing that on their day, they can beat the best teams, but having bad days, maybe that's very understandable. So I do think when Fremantle will click, they really will click, but I don't know if I see it this year. So their back line is their strongest line, in my opinion. Uh, Brennan Cox, Luke Ryan, Alex Pierce, um, Heath Chapman comes into this side, a guy who rates. Hayden Young probably comes out, you'd think, to play in the midfield, but the midfield as well could have a bit of a different look. So I think a uh, back in Brayshaw to get back to his best form. Caleb Sarong is a young star. You reinforce that with, you know, potentially a Hayden Young. Well, he will be playing midfield this year. To what extent does he come in and become a star midfielder? That remains to be seen. Um, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, but I do think he's made a good start. But whether he can be that Luke Hodge type midfielder that some are suggesting, it's a question mark, but he is also a prodigious talent. So I'm not suggesting he's not a good player. But is his best position halfback? That's the part that remains to be seen. But if we look at this optimistically, it does give a different look to their midfield. Some size in there, some real class. He is different to Brayshaw and, and um, I nearly said Chera and uh, Sarong. And Fife as well, I think, could be a bit of a wild card. Now, at his age, I don't expect him to be getting 28 touches a game. But if he's an impact burst player, and again, what is he, 195 centimeters, Fife? Or is he shorter than that? Either way, he's six foot three plus. Uh, big guy. He's definitely not 195, actually, now I think about it. But he's he's a big guy. Um, maybe, so in terms of positional weaknesses, wing, that is a question mark they need to answer, and that could be answered from within. I like Chapman in that role, potentially. O'Driscoll is another one there. Jeremy Sharp. Now, forgive me, I'm not going to get too excited about Jeremy Sharp being signed as a listed free agent and revolutionizing Fremantle. Not that the people were making that claim, but I, I think that is, that is a thing that they need to to look at and, and rectify. And hopefully for them, Jeremy Sharp is the answer to that. But it's their goals that makes me reluctant with Fremantle. So Amos kicked 41, Walters kicked 30 odd. And I know that Schultz tied with Walters. So where are the goals gonna come from other than that? Now you could certainly optimistically say that, well, Amos could take his game to the next level again, maybe. Uh, I think he's a jet, but it doesn't always happen that way, right? With young key forwards. Josh Tracy should kick more goals than last year. He seems to be tracking okay and, and developmentally probably on the same, you know, trajectory as, as many others in terms of like his rate of improvement. So the fact that he doesn't kick a lot of goals now isn't necessarily a huge marker against him, but still unproven naturally. And uh, Walters is 34. So when you take Shaw's out of this team, I think this is a, is a big problem. Now, Luke Jackson is a bit of a wild card here. He's a gun player. What is his best role kind of remains to be seen, but 22 goals. Last year, a goal of games, not bad. Um, but is he a forward or is he a, a ruck? Is he both? Is he just a high impact player? He could still be an amazing player and not kick that many goals. So, but he is, he is potentially a wild card here that could lift them. Like if he really elevates, which is possible. So I see potential there with Frio and I think it's a, a matter of time, but they do need to address this forward line thing. Uh, Gold Coast, again, this one is uh, maybe similar to Frio is where like when they click, I think it could be explosive, but is it this year? We don't know yet. You know, they didn't finish the season very convincingly, but they do have Damien Hardwick now. And, and then as much as like his tactical prowess and, you know, proven coaching ability could have an impact, 
it's also the psychology of those players. Like those players who go, oh, we got a hard week now. They might suddenly have a lot more belief in what they're building. Um, just a theory, but I think it makes sense. But in terms of their best 22, I don't know how settled their back line is. I think their tools are pretty decent. Ballard, Collins, and Andrews. Uh, Andrews, sorry. There's That's quality. No concerns there. It's probably the, the smaller medium types. Like Alex Sexton's going to be trialed through there. Butterick's back and looks pretty good. Um, probably also... Another team looking at some wing options. So Will Power, does he move up the field? Um, and this is, of course, in the absence of Lockie Weller. Young Gun's about to take the next step. Again, this doesn't happen in a linear fashion, and Raul Anderson and Flanders are still young. Anderson is by far and way the most proven out of them because he had a great season, but, and I see the potential with Raul and Anderson, but we are talking about 23 rolls. So I still think, you know, 12th isn't bad, but if we're talking about a genuine finals push... Um, it would be a bit of a surprise to see it all click at the same time, but it is possible. Humphreys is another player to watch, obviously, but it sounds like he's going to be playing more forward, and I think for where he's at in his development and age, that's about right. But I do like their forward line. Lacocious and King are a pretty understated key forward duo. Again, they must turn 24 this year, so very young, and King's just recommitted for two years, which is a good sign. Again, it just takes him to free agency. It's no guarantee, but it's still a good sign. So I do like the forward line mix. I, t- I talked about Ainsworth before. Could Roses Jr. bob up and, and really fill that Isaac Rankin void that kind of is no doubt a big blow. Interestingly, the Gold Coast Suns are middle tier for age and experience when you analyze the stats. But I, I do think that that's probably inflated a little bit by like some, some veterans that are outside their best 22, in my opinion. Uh, so when you're looking at their core contributors, we're looking at a lot of 24 and unders. Um, so again, it's a ticking time bomb with Gold Coast. I, I think with Hardwick, I can be more confident than ever, but we'll see. It remains to be seen. Great. So we're up to the part of the podcast where I'm talking about my finals mix. And it might be a bit of a cop out, but I had 6th to 11th in one group because I see these sides as genuine final contenders or at least a little bit more predictable than, say, the teams that I just mentioned. So I'll, I'll group them. St. Kilda, Adelaide, Western Bulldogs, Melbourne in 9th and Port Adelaide in 10th and Geelong in 11th. Now, I will preface this. If you didn't see the latter prediction, I did kind of justify it by saying I don't think Melbourne and Port are the ninth and best, uh, 10th best teams in the comp. Like, There's still outside premiership chances. Like, uh, I think there's probably seven teams that I think could win the premiership and Melbourne and Port are probably in that mix. But the part of that video is trying to avoid having seven of the same finalists as last year because that's just how football works. Um, So let's start from the bottom and go with Geelong. Now, before I do that, I just want to plug a couple of things because I forgot to do it at the start. Um, Got a newsletter now for True Footy. It's going to be a weekly email newsletter um, sent straight to your inbox. And uh, I'm going to pin it in the top comment of this YouTube video. So all your listeners, maybe just find a way. I I don't know how to give it to you other than that. Um, Top comment. And it's all completely free. And it's just a different way of receiving content from me that'll be different from what's in the videos. I've also started an Eagles YouTube channel. So if you haven't seen True Eagle, go check it out if you're interested, of course. All right, let's talk about the Cats. Now, again, I'm just I'm just really hesitant to, to discount them, but I do have them at the bottom of this group who could play finals. But I put their range as 7th to 12th because I just do not see Geelong capitulating. I think last year's as bad as it's going to get, but at least, you know, barring something crazy. So, KPDs. The key position defenders usually start from the back. Uh, decent. I think of Tom Stewart as more of like a medium interceptor. So other than that, like it's DeConing and then Henry kind of as well. Um, that being said, I think their back line's not an issue. I was kind of more leading into the fact that we maybe see Connor Rose Sullivan a little bit this year. That would be exciting. But I think their back line is pretty sweet. Buse, Colour Jasney, Guthrie, like some underrated plays in there. Uh, and then his brother Cam Guthrie as well just played six games last year. And as a midfield acquisition, almost like a recruit, I think that could give Geelong the improvement that other people are not seeing because I do think he is their best midfielder. But around that, it's the midfield is their Achilles heel. I ranked it as the, a bottom tier midfielder in my recent video. So there's Guthrie, there's Atkins, and maybe we see more of Max Holmes. So where I think the improvement could come from for Geelong is Tanner Bruin and Max Holmes and maybe Parfit. I don't know how close to the genuine midfield rotations he's going to be this year. I generally don't know. And, you know, we could see Danger rotate through there, of course. Um, so, but is he is he going to do that at 34, like ser- play serious midfield minutes? That's where the, the question is. There's also Jack Bowes who could rotate through there. Either way, it's a work in progress. 
and I don't even see like the best version of this Geelong midfield I have got my serious doubts when you also factor in the right combination so is it Reece Stanley this year I presume so he's 34 right Uh, and Toby Conway's played like one game I think something like that and he seems like a good prospect well we are talking about holding down a genuine AFL ruck spot and that that position out of anywhere in the ground takes longer to uh, to develop into if that makes sense the forward line is top tier though the tools combined for 100 goals last year in Cameron and Hawkins. And Cameron, I think, missed some footy, but was still unbelievable. Ollie Henry kicked 41 goals. So this is where they can hurt teams enough. Uh, Brian, uh, Brian Myers as well, Stengel, close. Like, it's it's hot. That is a hot forward line. And this is where they'll punish teams, I think. They, if they can neutralize the midfield battle, Geelong will pile on the goals at various points this year. And that's why I just don't think, think they'll finish in the bottom six. Like I said, I'm less confident than some of the teams I got above them, but still in the mix. Definitely still in the mix. Mid, uh, Port Adelaide, uh, again, so ignore <laughs> to some extent. Like, don't hold me too like close to what I've said about where they're going to finish. It's a bit of fun. I'd rather not be judged on my ladder predictions. I'd rather be judged about the things I say. Um, but anyway, midfield. It's top-heavy. It's strong. Um, you know, Rosie and Butters are stars. Like, there's no... There's nothing really more that needs to be said about that. It's probably the the depth behind that. Like, it, can Ollie Wines really recreate the player that he was? I mean, that sounds a little bit melodramatic, but obviously he won a Brownlow in 2021 and probably hasn't hit that form since. So to what extent can he step up and be the third prong in that midfield? I think would be fairly key for them this year. Uh, the forward line will be interesting. I think this is going to be a forward line in transition this year. So we saw a bit of Ollie Lord last year, and Charlie Dixon is probably, or possibly, very vulnerable to being phased out of this team. George Yardis comes back into the mix. I think Todd Marshall could take his game to the next level. He's probably the only one I'd be willing to absolutely lock in. Todd Marshall is going to be a lock for this team. But is Charlie Dixon, is George Yardis, is Lord, is Finn Layson? I'm sure Port Adelaide fans will have better and nuanced takes than, than what I'm offering here, but... I mean, Finn Mason did kick 38 goals last year, but either way, this competition, is, it's healthy competition, and I think their mids and, and smaller types, sorry, their medium and smaller types are pretty good, like Powell Pepper and Rioli. They did transplant into new key defenders and a couple of rucks as well. So that is going to be an interesting one to watch as to how they gel. It could improve them. It could, you'd think it would improve them. Um, but I'm just trying to give a balanced take on this. I think the list is mature and it still has some upside. And I do have the sense with Port Adelaide here that if they don't fire anytime soon, I still think they're okay. Like their window's set up for a while, I reckon. Um, Horn Francis is a wild card here. What can he do as a third year player? Remains to be seen, but it seems like he had a pretty good preseason showdown. Let's talk about Melbourne. Um, I think this team is fairly top end on paper. It really is. So me having them ninth is not something that I... I'm really going to argue to the hilt. It was more about finding teams that could be vulnerable. And the vulnerabilities for them are, well, the season hasn't kicked off and they've lost two players, Joel Smith and Brayshaw. And I think Brayshaw is important depth as that fourth or fifth string midfielder in that team. Uh, on the plus side, Oliver seems to be all good. So we can probably assume he's going to be there for round one and beyond. So the midfield stacks up. Um, could this open up the door for Caleb Windsor into the side? You know, maybe it's a reprieve for Langdon and Hunter. I don't know if those guys were necessarily locks to be in their team all year this year. Um, but Windsor, I am optimistic about, and it could give them a different look. Their forward line is also really good on paper, I reckon. So the key positional forwards, obviously on paper, are not that strong. But Van Royen, with the responsibility, he could go either way. He could get overwhelmed, or he could really step up his game. And Jai Amos probably... You know, he didn't get overwhelmed. He had a great season. And I think JVR needs to just keep similar amount of goals to have a really big... Like, I would consider that a big year for Van Roy and, and and the Ds. So last year, we, we talked a lot about their mid-forward connection. So there's just some mechanics of their game style they need to work through. And it's it's hard to forecast until we see it in action. But they're strong across all lines. Their back line's sweet. I absolutely see them challenging again. But yeah, I just threw that one out there. Let's go for the Bulldogs. Uh, midfield dominant team that has underachieved a little bit over the last couple of years and mounting pressure on their coach. So they're second only to Brisbane in clearances this year. And I think Bonten Pelly is, is the best midfielder of the game. So that's a really good start, isn't it? And I think on paper, this team is good. But I also think um, that potentially, you know, 
Bailey Smith being out of this team on paper, like it does diminish it. But you know, we we saw Smith and even to some extent McRae and Trelaw underutilized a little bit last year, like push out to wings or half forward or whatever it was. And maybe now, if they're forced into a certain midfield combination or composition with and and Riley Sanders comes into this team, I still think I still think midfield is going to be pretty good this year. I actually do think Riley Sanders is going to have a huge year. He's probably the second most ready-made prospect. You'd have to say Harley Reid's the most ready-made, but Riley Sanders, certainly with his endurance, like is probably more ready-made for a midfield position than Harley Reid is. But it's their forward line as well, which I think has some real upside. So Norton's only 24. Jamara's 21. Wow. Is that right? He was 2021 draft. Must have been born in 2003. No, he's 2020 draft. 2002. Makes him 22 this year. Okay, so I, th- I think it's probably a little bit early for Jamara. But I do actually think their upside could come from Norton. He's kind of been around so long, you forget how young he is. He's the same age as Oscar Allen. They're both turning 25 this year. I think there's some upside there, and I think Waitman as well was another young star. So the forward line has some some punch to it, and I, it would be great to see a little bit more from Rory Lobb as that third tall this year. But outside of that, I do kind of think that forward half probably lacks some mediums to small types. Like, is Anthony Scott going to come in to this 22? Like, I actually don't know. Um, I, that When I looked at their best 22, I found that to be a bit of a vulnerability and probably the strength of their key position defenders as well. But for them, I think, like, we can talk all we want about the best 22, but I think their best 22 is underachieved for a couple of years. So the mentality piece is exactly why I haven't put them higher. I have got them in my eight, but it's the lack of confidence in their ability to click. It's just that they've been unpredictable. Like, we've seen them make finals and then, you know, tear shit up, 2021, 2016. But again, it's probably just the lack of faith, like, the Bulldogs haven't made the top four once since like 2010 and they've won a premiership and played in a grand final since then. So as far as it goes with ladder predictions, it's hard to hard to back that up. So we got the Crows and the Saints. So I'm optimistic about both of these sides. I've got the Crows seventh and the Saints sixth. In, in the video on the short version of this, I actually kind of talked down Adelaide whilst putting them seventh. I didn't really mean to do that. Like I think the case for them making finals is really strong. Um, I think I made the point that they're probably a little bit vulnerable to, you know, how, how equipped are they to, to lose Jordan Dawson hypothetically? And that's part of this analysis is like considering how vulnerable some teams are to injury versus others. That being said, I'm just going to weight it on their best 22 and then their output. And I think their system and the way they've played over a number of years has given me faith that maybe they will cope. It's just a, just something worth considering. You know, they, will, they want to start to see a bit of a baton change in the forward half, like with Tex kicking 75 goals last year. I mean, that's all well and good, but he's bloody old now, right? Respectfully. Um, so, yeah, they've got the talent there. Phil Thorpe and Fogarty in particular come to mind, and they're also going to get Tyler Welsh this year's draft, but they, they probably want us to close the gap a little bit between Phil Thorpe, Fogarty, and Tex. Uh, that's one consideration. Um, and they've just got a lot of young guys who are possibly going to either explode or take a serious stride and I do think their improvement does rely on that so I'm talking specifically about Rochelle Pedler to some extent Saligo very good player uh, you know even Rankin I think Rankin's probably the most proven out of those uh, but he could become an All-Australian small forward this year like there's no doubt about that but the home ground advantage is where I see like real faith in Adelaide so they they were explosively good at home but they also did have some bad performances at home I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what they were Okay, round two against Richmond, pretty early in the season. Got beat by the Giants at the uh, back end there, and I feel like there was one more. Um, I won't include the Sydney one <laughs> for obvious reasons, but I, I feel like there was a, a third one. But anyway, you extrapolate their, their youth improving. Uh, it's hard not to have faith in the Crows. And for the Saints, again, like I think, I think they're a little bit slept on. I think they're a pretty damn good team. Uh, like I said, one thing I find compelling about them is the ability to play a, a comp- compelling game style and you do generally see that teams that really go deep in finals usually commit to a game style really well and that makes them less vulnerable to injuries and you'd say St Kilda last year weren't super vulnerable to the injuries they experienced in the first six weeks the time where Max King and Tim Membry weren't there they do need to tighten up their forward line Uh, statistically it was one of the worst all time it was the eighth worst time forward line uh, eighth worst all time forward line for converting inside 50s into scores. But the talent is there, so 
diagnosing that is a little tricky, but you know, the Smalls and Higgins and, and Butler, Machido is a bit of a, a, a hybrid, Philippou is a bit of a hybrid, and you know, King and Membry, like this team packs a punch. I think their midfield's probably their weakest line, but what I see with St Kilda is them being good enough to make finals, absolutely. I could see them all the way up to fourth if they win enough games. Cont- going head to head in finals, big finals, St Kilda, I, I, that's probably where I'd stop short. I don't think I'd see them like knocking off a Collingwood at, at the MCG. But, you know, progress is progress, and I think that's fairly compelling. All right, so we're into our top five now. And I think all of these are premiership contenders, and to, very, to some extent, you can throw a blanket over these teams. And I haven't ordered them in the order that I actually rate them because you would just start with the grand finalists, right? So I've tried to shake it up a little bit and give some justification for that. But I think all of Brisbane, GWS, Sydney, Carlton, and Collingwood are a premiership capable team. And I would include Melbourne and Port Adelaide, even though I, I included them outside of my eight. It wouldn't shock me if they won the premiership. Those are probably the seven, and I'd probably leave it at that. I'm really hedging my bets there. Imagine one of those seven doesn't win the flag. How silly will this look? Um, (laughs) Yeah, funny. But okay, let's start with fifth in Collingwood. So obviously the case for Collingwood going back to back is is strong. Um, And this is not a real reflection of what I think of them. I think I've been pretty pro Collingwood actually. I've made a fair bit of Collingwood content this off season. Um, So there's no, I have no doubt that they could certainly win the whole thing again. But we are looking for reasons where teams can be vulnerable. And I think it's easier to make that case with Collingwood than, say, a Brisbane because of the deficiencies in their best 22, we'll call it that. And the thing is that that doesn't mean a lot when they go out and win premierships because it was probably one of the least balanced best 22s I've seen win a flag. Uh, And I say that with respect because, um, you know, it's arguably more impressive, but what they've really built their premiership side on is an amazing game style, an incredible mentality, but also really high quality, medium to small types. And I would say there's only one elite tall in their team in Darcy Moore. I would say also that, well, their backline in the midfield is their strength, right? So uh, every every player in that backline is a certified gun, uh, with the exception of maybe Frampton, if you consider... um, him, you know, in the best 22 defense. And, and maybe you wouldn't say Murphy is a certified A grader, but like Maynard, Crisp, Jeremy Howe, Quainor, uh, Dacos. It's it's very easy to, to pick out stars in that back line. And the midfield is good and deep. And it'll be interesting to see how much on-ball time Dacos plays this year. But, you know, past that, sure, it's a little bit vulnerable with guys like Pendlebury and Sidebottom and Mitchell towards the back end of their careers. But similar to Geelong, like... Just because we say they're getting old, it doesn't actually always translate. Like I, I'm not going to make that argument. And I do think that Schultz coming in does give this forward line even more dangerous looks at it. So Bobby Hill, Schultz, McCreary, and Jamie Elliott, as far as small go, Smalls goes, that's probably the best batch in the comp. But it's the t- tall targets where they're vulnerable, uh, which I've talked about a lot. And that, that is ultimately what is giving me the reason to discount Collingwood a little bit. If I had to pick a team, so, you know, McStay is out for the whole year. Yeah, they won the premiership without him, but, you know, they played most of the season with him in the team. So it's the longevity of being able to find a reliable way of scoring. And Majacek, Johnson, Reef McInnes, Mason Cox, it doesn't stack up that well. So that would be a question mark for him. That's all I'm saying. It's going to be a big question mark for him. Um, but the mentality of this Collingwood side makes them incredibly hard to tip against, and I don't feel confident in them missing the four. It's just, I think the case is there to be made. So I have made that point, and I will move on. Collingwood, in, uh, sorry, Carlton in fourth. Uh, again, I don't necessarily rate Carlton above Collingwood, but you know what? They're not far off. Like they're pretty damn good. So let's go through the case for Carlton. Spine. They're probably the best spine in the comp. I am actually going to do a team maker on that soon. Uh, but off the top of my head, without an- analyzing it, with the exception of maybe Brisbane, theirs is pretty good too. But, you know, Mackay Kerno, I know Mackay's out of form, but that's two Colwell medalists. Whichever midfielder you want to pick, Sam Walsh might be the pick of the bunch this year is my tip, but there's Cripps, there's Chera, it's outstanding, and Weedering down back. So there's just a really good balance there. And I, I've been saying for a while, I see the recipe for long, a long sustained window here for Carlton. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be start this year. Was last year a bit of a false dawn? I think the talent is mature enough. I think they've come a long way, so I'm going to back them in. 
Uh, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're going to be a genuine premiership contender this year. Like they could be sixth, seventh, whatever. And that's the, that's kind of the mentality thing as well that we have to try and forecast with teams. Now Carlton look pretty mentally resilient in the second half of last year, but historically not been great on delivering on some promise. So that comes back to the trust question that I've talked about with some other teams. That being said, I have put them forth, so we won't necessarily go down that path any further. Um, the Smalls forward line is pretty good. Like there's Motlop, who I think will be a good contributor this year. And there's some just good role plays in that team, like maybe Cottrell's, you're always... The, the, there's probably some unheralded depth there. And as well, the, the, the age of this team is not bad. Um, you know, their, their oldest players are like Doherty, Saad, who are 30. I think Mitch McGovern's 29. Uh, mind you, they'll all turn 31 and 30 this year. And Cripps will turn 29 this year. But other than that, you've got a lot of players in their prime. So the case to be made for Carlton being a serious contender this year is strong. But I just haven't put them as high as first or second, probably just due to that lack of trust. So let's talk about the Swans who I had in third. And... I, you know, analyzing their best 22, I have heart on about their key backs and, and uh, I'll, I'll encapsulate that very shortly and I'll just say that I think that's a vulnerability with McCartan, their best key back at 193 centimeters and Hamling and Melican 194. It's just not that tall. Um, it doesn't mean they're, you know, in dire straits, but it is, it is a vulnerability while we're calling out list deficiencies. Um, I expected them to go a little bit harder for a genuine key back. But what they do have for them is, is now some midfield depth. Like the conversation about Sydney going into 2023's trade period was how they can build some midfield depth. And when you write all the names down, gee, it, it stacks up nicely, I reckon. Um, and it does help that Errol Gould has announced himself as one of the best mids in the comp. Callum Mills is out, but they got Taylor Adams into this side. Um, who else we got there? We got Chad Warner. Um, you know, Park is still there. If you forecast, you know, when Mills comes back at the back end of the year, they're almost going to have a selection headache, I reckon. There's just a lot of good players in this midfield. Um, I think the forward line can pack a punch, there's no doubt, but it's a little bit either young or potentially a little bit unreliable. So I'll go into specifics. So the, the tall trio of McDonald, Amati, and McLean is good. Uh, but are any of them going to kick 50 goals? This could be the year for Logan McDonald, who is my favorite of the three. It could be, um, yeah, but he is also 22, right? Like turning 22 this year. So it is early days, but either way, I think that's strong. I'm not saying it's a weakness, but it, it is also a little bit unproven. Uh, you know, Heaney is a big question mark here. And I do, I kind of see Heaney as potentially being one of those late bloomer types. And you know, what I mean by that is he's kind of flirted with his best form. He 49 goals in 2022 and then dipped away again a little bit. His radar was off last year, but... I could see him being one of those players that at 30 just continues to get better. I, mean, I feel like Toby Green's a bit like that. I feel like Heaney could follow down that path. So his form is a, is a big variable in this, I think. Because you, to some extent, you know we're going to get from your Tom Papley types. The team is strong, mostly well-balanced with one clear deficiency, I would say, and a good blend of youth and experience. Like they've got no shortage of veterans, and I haven't even mentioned Brody Grundy coming to this team. That was another name I meant to mention. So they've finally got a number one ruck they can really set their watch to to quote Abe Simpson. Um, and some like up and coming youth that I really like. So like Chad Warner still is, you know, I feel like he's going to be a good player. Like he's a very good footballer and will continue to improve. I think he was 2019 draft, so very young. Golden's barely scratched the surface of what he could achieve, I reckon. Um, Braden Campbell potentially off a wing or a halfback flank this year gives him a different look. Blake, he's probably in his prime now. It's just well balanced and it's hard to, to go past him. And I think ultimately, Plugging the you know the ruck gap, midfield depth, and just getting the players fitter. I think that was one thing you know that I don't think they were fit last year for a variety of reasons. And if you back in their ability to get fit by round one, I think Sydney. I just don't think they're going to falter this year. I think uh, I back them in. So we're down to our final two teams and GWS. Now I tips GWS for the premiership, and I've got them finishing second this year. I don't believe that their form last year was a false dawn. In fact, I think the form that preceded that was the false dawn to some extent. I think their backline's unreal. Like, I feel like on paper it might even be the best. St Kilda fans will bristle with that. I'm not going to make that claim too harsh. I'm just going to say that GWS is right up there. Sam Taylor is an absolute star. I think Jack Buckley, I really noticed him in the prelim, but he had a really good back end of the year. Your medium types in Iden, Ash, coming, and obviously uh, Lockie Whitfield. Like, there's depth, there's firepower, there's 
defensive prowess, there's running carry, there's speed, there's youth, there's experience, there's everything you want in a back line. Midfield is strong. That's obviously headlined by some veterans. You know, your Cornelios, your Whitfields, your Kellys, and you've also got Tom Green coming up from underneath and Finn Callahan too. So I don't know how deep that midfield depth is. And if it gets tested, you know, to what extent do O'Halloran and, and Rouston can they play a role this year outside the 22? That's probably one area that is a little bit vulnerable, but it's really nitpicking there. And their forward line, in particular, I think is going to be built off the prowess of some of their smaller types. So a duo of Daniels and Green, uh, supported by, um, what's his name? Toby Bedford. That is who I was thinking of. There's some real ground level prowess there. And the forwards in Hogan and Riccardi really saw some progress. And we're also going to see Aaron Cadman feature. And the good thing about Cadman is, yes, he's a second year, 195 centimeter key forward. But because of his ability to play on the wing, well, that was originally what he was before he became a key forward. I can see him playing higher up the ground and genuinely adding something different to this forward line. So given the late season surge, I find it easy to extrapolate a top four finish for GWS and their ability to win finals. And I think play well at the MCG to some extent, at least in the prelim, gives them a red hot chance. So I think they're, they're my team. They're my team for this year to win the premiership. Let's talk about the Brisbane Lions who are as good as anyone and could conceivably win the premiership. I just kind of thought it would be a little bit cliche to tip Brisbane, uh, but it could easily happen. And they've been on some linear improvement since 2019, or to some extent, maybe not perfectly linear, but they've gone deeper over time. A little bit of a drop in depth when you consider like Daniel Rich, Marcus Adams, uh, leaving Jack Gunston, but they did add Tom Dode to this team as well, which I think is going to be a plus, but to what extent we can expect him to impact in his first season back from an ACL, albeit half a season, is a question mark, but worth mentioning. In terms of their vulnerabilities, like you may, maybe the midfield's a little bit one-paced, uh, particularly without Ashcroft for the first half of it, but you know it's served them pretty well up to this point, hasn't it? Um, the Coleman breakout, I think as well, that's what I've written down here, what I'm talking about is Kitty Coleman taking his game to the next level in the first half form we saw from him in the grand final. I just think him combined with Dode does give their back line a bit of a different edge to it. And it was already a good back line. And, and Jack Payne is another good player that emerged last year. So Harris Andrews, Jack Payne, there's running carry there, good medium types. I think on paper, this back line is strong. I think the midfield is strong, albeit maybe a little bit one paced. And their forward line is super dangerous and arguably mostly dangerous because there's so many different ways that they can hurt you. Like Danaher and Hipwood combined for, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I reckon it was over 100 goals. I think Danaher kicked 60, and I think Hipwood kicked in the 40s. I could be wrong. And Cameron kicked 55, something like that. And, you know, statistically very good pressure forward. So, again, I'm just selling you on things you already know, and it's the reliability and the consistency at home for Brisbane that makes me super confident they'll be in the mix again. It's really hard to picture Brisbane falling off. Um... You know, but there are so many variables that we don't get access to. Like historically, they've generally had a good injury run because they, you can probably give them credit for a good program up there. Uh, their players get back, generally speaking, and they're good at home. But it's the psychology piece. You know, that's what makes footy unpredictable. But Brisbane haven't really given us any reason to doubt them in the past, and they've come a long way with regards to their MCG performances. And they they could have easily won that grand final. So that's ultimately what I decided. Brisbane top of the ladder but I have GWS beating Sydney in the grand final. But again, these predictions, the, the, that's not the part you should focus on. It's just, my, I suppose, the, my opinions on what I've said. But of course, you're probably going to find gaps with that. And I, I welcome you to let me know in the comments section what you agree with and disagree with. But for now, I'll probably wrap up the podcast, guys. I, um, it's been a great off season. I've gotten through and I appreciate all of you sticking fat with the channel. There has been people that have been there pretty much every day and I appreciate you. And I might be the only AFL YouTuber to ever be burnt out before round one. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm good. But I do probably need to need to look after myself a little bit better. But I appreciate you guys. I hope you got something out of this podcast. And for now, I will say goodbye and see you in the next video, which is probably going to be a few hours away because I upload so bloody much. But take it easy.